Yes, hello, Professor Love, and thank you for having me. Hello, hello, Professor Love, and thank you for having me. Glad to have you, sir. Thank you very much. I was just telling the students a little bit about your background. You can certainly elaborate, but I told them about your expertise in medical malpractice and that you're a civil litigator, and you've been doing this work for quite some time. And he also has his own legal blog. Uh, and so if you want to learn about various legal issues, just type in legal blogs, and you'll get a lot of them coming up uh, so that you can follow various issues. It's a nice, inexpensive way for you to start learning about what's going on in the world of certain, uh, like environmental law, criminal law, whatever the case may be, okay? So with that, we're going to turn it over to Kwame. He's going to talk about the uh, police state, uh, what's going on in America with respect to how we are policing Americans. Kwame? Hello, and thank you for having me. I am attorney Kwame Thompson. I've been practicing law for 20 years, and I am a civil litigator. My specialty is personal injury. I also have taught on the collegiate level for 10 years in the paralegal studies program at Atlanta Technical College, and I do a lot of guest appearances. I'm a graduate with Miss Deborah Love, your professor, from Trial Lawyers College. Today, I want to speak about police killings in America. We're going to explore police killings in America. In recent months, we have witnessed the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. These murders have shed light on police killings in America and also the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, who was killed by an ex-police officer, George Michael, and his son and neighbor have also been arrested in that case. According to MappingPoliceViolence.com, police have killed 1,098 people in 2019. Black people were 24% of those killed despite being only 13% of the population, as you all have just discussed in your class, the population of blacks in America. There were only 27 days in 2019 where police did not kill someone. And black people are more likely to be killed by the police. Since January the 1st, 2015, 1,252 Black people have been shot and killed by the police, according to the Washington Post database tracking police shootings. That doesn't even include those who died in police custody or were killed using other methods like strangulation, as in the case of George Floyd, or those who were killed by former police officers, as in the case of Ahmaud Arbery. So that number is high and doesn't even include all of the people who were killed by police or killed by former police, only those who were shot and killed by police. Black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. Black people killed by police are 1.3 times more likely to be unarmed compared to white people. And where you live matters. Blacks in Oklahoma are six times more likely to be killed by police than blacks in my state, Georgia. Eight out of the 100 largest police departments kill black men at rates higher than the US murder rate. Eight of the 100 largest police departments kill black men at higher rates than the US murder rate. Those cities are Reno, Oklahoma City, Santa Ana, Anaheim, Unfortunately, my home city of St. Louis, Missouri, Scottsdale and Hialeah, Florida and Madison. Now let's look at debunking the myths, the truth versus the farce. There is a false narrative that police brutality is relative to crime. Often you will hear opponents and conservatives argue that people were deserving to be killed that they were resisting, that they were criminals. And that's not always the case. And that is a force that's not true. It's not about crime. Levels of violent crime 
in the U.S. do not determine rates of police violence. For example, in Buffalo, New York, the violent crime rate is 12 per capita and zero people were killed by the police in Buffalo between 2013 and 2016. The violent crime rate in Orlando was lower at nine per 1,000. However, 13 people were killed between 2013 and 2016. There is no accountability. 99% of killings by police from 2013 to 2019 have not resulted in officers being charged with a crime. So there is no incentive against police killings. And we have qualified immunity. And we'll look at what qualified immunity is. Qualified immunity is a type of legal immunity. Qualified immunity balances the important interests, the need to hold public officials accountable when they exercise power irresponsibly, and the need to shield officials from harassment, distraction, liability when they perform their duties. And that is the Supreme Court case of Person versus Callahan. Specifically, Qualified immunity protects a government official from lawsuits alleging that the official violated a plaintiff's right, only allowing suits where officials violated a clearly established statutory or constitutional right. Qualified immunity is not immunity from having to pay money damages, but rather immunity from having to go through the cost of a trial. Accordingly, courts must resolve qualified immunity issues early in a case. Let's look at one spe specific case, Malley versus Briggs. In Malley versus Briggs, that can be found at 47 U.S. 335, 1986 case. The Supreme Court examined immunity for police officers with regard to acting on the basis of a faulty warrant. The court held that qualified immunity does not apply to a police officer when the officer wrongfully arrests someone on the basis of a warrant if the officer who could not reasonably believe that there was probable cause for the warrant. Reasonability is determined by the action that an objectively reasonable officer would take. And I took the opportunity to pull the case of Mally D. Briggs just to get a better understanding. The case was tried to a jury and the court while granting a directed verdict, because remember we said that qualified immunity must be determined early in the case. So by directed verdict for petitioner on the grounds that of the close of respondents evidence stated that a police officer who believes that the facts stated in an affidavit are true and submits them to a neutral magistrate may be entitled to immunity under the objectiveness reasonableness, objective reasonableness standard of Harlow versus Fitch drill. U.S. Court of Appeals 47457 U.S. 800. The Supreme Court held that petitioner is not entitled to absolute immunity, but only to qualified immunity from liability for damages. As a matter of public policy, qualified immunity provides ample protection to all but the plainly incompetent for those who knowingly violate the law. So that is the, a hurdle that individuals have for suing officers when it comes to police killings, the issue of qualified immunity. And I would suggest you all do your own independent research on that and all of these issues. Let's look at the case of Ahmaud Aubrey. Yes? Let me interject for a moment. Yes. So, Kwame uh, has cited some cases. And remember the Mayo State, the Satan case? And I said to you, there's a citation at the top to tell you where you can find the case. That's what he's, that's what he's doing. But you can find the case, for example, uh, it could be a U.S. Supreme Court case. It would be... 34 would be the volume, the U.S. Supreme Court, and then President Payton. So that's what he's saying. He's signing. Um, I have a question about qualified immunity. Could you tell us why we don't have more grand jury indictments? More grand jury indictments. Okay. Explain, explain the grand jury. So a, a grand jury is separate than a petite jury. A petite jury usually uh, sits anyone from 6 to 12 individuals. A grand jury is, is going to be larger from 12 to 24 people. A grand jury is convened by a prosecuting attorney to provide an indi indictment against an accused. So it is a private uh, hearing and the prosecutor is responsible for all of the evidence. So there's an old saying that 
a prosecutor can indict a potato, meaning that if the prosecutor brings in the evidence and they control the hearing, that they can indict whoever they want to. So a lot of times the prosecutors work with the police officers on a daily basis. They know them. And when police are brought before grand juries to be indicted, a lot of times they are not indicted, as we just saw, because the evidence produced by the um, prosecutor is not strong enough or convincing to the grand jury. In the case of Michael Brown's murder in my home uh, county of St. Louis County, the record showed that one of the witnesses brought before the grand jury lied about being at the scene of the crime. And there were other witnesses who witnessed the killing who weren't allowed at the grand jury. So what uh, Professor Love mentioned was important. You have to know how to cite a case because whenever you are talking about the law, you want to make sure that you're applying the facts to the law. In my podcast, uh, Legally, the Legally Bomb podcast, I want to um, I, I have the, uh, the audience listen not only to the facts, but to the law. And I encourage you all to do the same. Look at the citations, write them down, write down the law and listen and collect the facts so that you all can make your own determinations. So I wanted to talk about three killings so that you all can see the facts as it relates to the law and these miscarriages of justice. And I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief. Um, on February the 23rd, Ahmaud Aubrey went for a jog in the Centilla Shores neighborhood about five miles outside of Brunswick, Georgia. A May 5th video of the murder was anonymous, anonymously uploaded to the internet. During Ahmaud's jog around the neighborhood, he was chased and gunned down by Gregory Michael, a former police officer from Glenn County, and his son, 34-year-old Travis McMichael. They were in a pickup truck and they were followed by their neighbor, Roddy Bryant, who also was charged in the murder. Mr. Aubrey was jogging down the road in the middle of the day. Two armed assailants, known now to be Gregory and Travis McMichael, parked their vehicles ahead of Mr. Aubrey. As he approached the two men who were unknown to him, Mr. Aubrey attempted to block, they attempted to block his path with their truck, the McMichaels. Travis McMichael is seen outside of his vehicle with a shotgun pointed at Aubrey and blocking his path. Mr. Aubrey makes multiple attempts to avoid the armed strangers before the first shot is fired. Mr. Aubrey then appears to collide with the attacking gunman known as Travis McMichael. Mr. Aubrey then appears to collide with the attacking gunman, as I just said, and he struggles for the gun in self-defense. At this point, Travis McMichael shoots Mr. Aubrey two additional times with a shotgun at point blank range. Mr. Aubrey collapses to the ground while still trying to escape his attackers. William Roddy Bryant, their neighbor, was an accessory and has also been charged. He filmed the murder and also blocked Mr. Aubrey in. The murder occurred on February the 23rd. So this is where we have to pay attention because you always see a lot of opposition and a lot of conservatives will argue that the police killings of black people is a farce, that it's not true. And that in a lot of times that's warranted. But we're going to show you examples of innocent people and it doesn't matter because even if you're guilty, you're not supposed to be shot by the police. Even the Supreme Court has ruled on those cases of fleeing suspects being shot in the back. So the murder occurred on February the 23rd, but there were no arrests as of May 5th. Because of the public's outcry, there now has been arrests because there was a videotape and because we marched and because we demanded justice. So let there be no doubt that the arrests were made because of what we saw, not because of what they saw, because the evidence has never changed and the police always had this evidence. So let's look at the cover up, a cover up. This is a modern day lynching. A lynching occurs when a mob kills someone for an alleged offense without a legal trial. We have seen lynchings throughout America, especially in the South, where innocent black men and women were killed for no crime at all. The only alleged offense being that of having melanin and that false allegations, which we will explore. Ahmaud Aubrey was a former high school football All-American player. He often jogged through the neighborhood southwest of Brunswick. 
He loves his loved ones described him as a very good man. He was training with the hopes of one day entering the NFL. One relative stated that he always was jogging and he loved to jog. Uh, one woman who I spoke to in the neighborhood stated that her kids often saw him jogging. Now, Gregory McMichael, remember that name, is a former Glenn County police officer and a former investigator from the Glenn County District Attorney's Office. Travis McMichael is his son. William Rody Bryant is their neighbor. The police... He, he told the police, the neighbor, that he jumped into the back of a pickup truck to chase Mr. Aubrey, but admitted to police that he filmed the murder. And we know that this now is not true because he had his own vehicle and he was heard cocking his gun on the video. So neither the McNichols nor Roddy Bryant had any direct knowledge that Ahmaud Aubrey had committed a crime before they gunned him down and they chased him down. Both the McMichaels were at their, home, at their home, the McMichaels and Brian had no direct knowledge or circumstantial evidence that Mr. Aubrey had committed a crime. The men had no view of Mr. Aubrey's actions nor location prior to seeing him jogging. This is important because the second prosecutor on the case, George Bornhill, wrote that Travis McMichael acted out of self-defense and their actions fell within Georgia's citizen's arrest laws. So hope that you all are paying attention because this is the second prosecuting attorney on this case, a person who was elected by the citizens of Glenn County. He stated that the men were acting in self-defense. He later recused himself from the case. But before he recused himself, he wrote in the April 7th letter that his son and the suspect Gregory McMichael helped with an earlier prosecu prosecution of Mr. Aubrey when they both had worked for the Brunswick Judicial District Attorney's Office. So the facts that the suspects did not have any knowledge of any alleged crime is key because it defeats the bogus citizen's arrest claim. Also note that the District Attorney of Waycross, George E. Barnhill, was the second prosecutor on the case. The first prosecutor, Jackie Johnson, the district attorney for Glenn County, recused herself because Gregory McMichael is one of her former investigators. So in the state of Georgia, a private person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his presence or within his immediate knowledge. If the offense in a is a felony and the offender is escaping, or attempting to escape, a private person may arrest him upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. That's the Georgia Code Annotated, Section 17-4-60. The McMichaels and Bryan had no authority to arrest. The McMichaels' statement, as pointed out by Attorney Chris Stewart, that they wanted to talk to Mr. Aubrey, quote, reflects that they were uncertain and did not have immediate knowledge that the victim had been the perpetrator of the alleged or any alleged theft. This is a direct recital from the case from Smith v. State. 314 Georgia Appellate Reporter, page 583, 2012. Attorney Chris Stewart also explains that from his years of practice in civil rights, that we are experiencing what is a phenomenon called tainting the pot tainting the pot. And these are the steps that people and prosecutors and those who are enemies of justice, they use to taint the pot. This is a blueprint where you have an innocent, unarmed black man or woman who is murdered by the police. And this is always going to be played out. One, the victim has been arrested before and it doesn't matter if it was years or decades earlier, tainting the pot too. The victim looked like another criminal, even if that later is found to be a mistake, tainting the pot, pot three. The victim has mental issues or had drugs in his system, even if untrue or unrelated, and painting the pot four. The victim attacked first or made a threatening movement, even if later to prove to be untrue. So only after the May 5th video was released, did the case receive any attention and 74 days had passed before there were any arrests. So on February 23rd, the police first notified Ahmaud Aubrey's mother of his death. She was told 
by the Clint Glenn County Police Department that her son was involved in a burglary and that there was a confrontation between her son and the homeowner and her son was shot and killed. And we now know that that is a lie. The Glenn County Police Department is the initial agency that was charged with the duty of investigating the killing of Ahmaud Aubrey. This is the same agency that Gregory McMichael used to work for. The third district attorney on the case, Tom Darden, of the neighboring Atlantic Judicial Circuit, requested that the GBI investigate the death of Ahmaud Aubrey on May 5th, only after the cell phone video footage of the murder went viral. Also on May 5th, the Glenn County Police Department requested the GBI to investigate the release of the leaked tape of the death of Ahmaud Aubrey. So rather than the police department requesting further investigation of the murder, they now wanted to punish the brave person who released the footage. Also, I would like to note that on April 29th, the Glenn County Police Department requested that the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, investigate allegations of threats made against the murderers, the McMichaels and Brian. Next, let's look at a few key issues as it relates to debunk, uh, debunking myths. The policy, the police's efforts and the district attorney efforts to tank the pot. Local police in Brunswick, Georgia, have now publicly confirmed that the Centilla Shores subdivision, the neighborhood where Travis and Gregory McMichael and William Bryant lived, did not have a rash of break-ins. Also, the Aubrey family attorney, Lee Merritt, has discovered multiple white people who said that they had have um, walked and ran through the neighborhood and through a home that was under construction without any of course, allegations. Lastly, two Glenn County commissioners, two Glenn County commissioners say that District Attorney Jackson, Jackie Johnson's office refused to allow the Glenn County Police Department to make arrests immediately after the February 23rd shooting death. The police were at the scene and one says there were the police at the scene who had done the investigation, said Commissioner Alan Booker who has spoken with Glenn County Police. Allen told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and went on to say she shut them down to protect her friend, McMichael. Commissioner Pete Murphy, who also said he spoke directly to Glenn County Police about the incident, said officers at the scene concluded they had probable cause to make arrest. But when contacted by Jackie Johnson's office, they were told to stand down. So this is just one example of a police killing of an unarmed black person that was caught on tape. And we see the extensive cover up from three, three prosecuting attorneys and a former police officer. And obviously several officers inside the department. Now I wanna look at the killing of Breonna Taylor. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So, um, putting aside the individual, it sounds to me like we have a system, a justice system, that is can lend itself to being biased or can't be unbiased. Yes. Um, and, right, right. And so that's across America, not just in Georgia. Right? Absolutely. That's an example. And I can give you all examples all day, all day. There's a system that's in place. We have to realize that modern day policing and police historians have agreed that modern day policing has its foundation in slave patrols, colonial slave patrols. And the purpose of those slave patrols were to maintain white privilege and subjugate blacks. So anytime you have a firm or a corporation, they have a firm culture. So we have an agency in the executive branch, law enforcement, who has a, a culture of subjugating blacks while maintaining privilege. So this is something that happens all across America. And now it's starting to be exposed more because thank God we have students like your students. We have millennials who are fighting for justice and we have technology and people are starting to fight against these injustices. We always have fought against those injustices, but now people are fighting even more. Yeah, I want to bring home the point that um, 
the issue of you probably heard of systemic racism, right? Or systemic yeah. sexism, right? Yes, so both, yes. The yeah, and the individual say, I'm not a racist. And, you know, you want to say, okay, I'm not looking at you as an individual. It's not you that's really committing the devastating harm. It's the system. Absolutely. That's, that, that's what we have to challenge. And as lawyers, you will be obligated to challenge the system that's not working for justice, whether it's criminal law, civil law, whatever the case may be. Keep that in mind, right? If the system is not providing justice, and you're not on the side of justice, you really can't be a really great lawyer. Yes. How much time do I have? 6.30. Huh? You have until 6.30. 6.30. Okay. Okay. It's seven here, seven oh six here. Okay. All right. Well, next I want to look at the death of Breonna Taylor. So what happened in Louisville? Shortly after midnight on March the 13th, Louisville police officers executing a search warrant used a battering ram to enter the apartment of Breonna Taylor, a 26 year old African-American emergency room technician. Ms. Taylor and her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, had been in bed, got up when they heard a loud banging at the door. After a brief exchange, Mr. Walker fired his gun. The police also fired several sh shots, striking Miss Taylor. Mr. Walker told investigators Miss Taylor coughed and struggled to breathe for at least five minutes after she was shot, according to the Louisville Courier Journal. She received no medical attention for more than 20 minutes after she was struck, according to the Courier Journal Constitution. No drugs were found in Ms. Taylor's apartment. Her apartment was under investigation because allegedly two men were believed to be selling drugs out of a house that was far away from Ms. Taylor's, but a judge had signed a warrant allowing the police to search Ms. Taylor's residence because the police said they believed that one of the two men had used her apartment to receive packages. The judge's order was a so-called no-knock warrant which allowed the police to enter without warning or without identifying themselves as law enforcement. So the police account is disputed hotly. Ms. Taylor's relatives and their lawyers say that the police never identified themselves before entering, despite their claims. They also say that Mr. Walker was licensed to carry a gun. Mr. Walker, 27, has said that he feared for his life and only fired in self-defense, believing that someone was trying to break into their home. He didn't know these were police and they found no drugs in the apartment, said Robert Egert, Mr. Walker's lawyer. He was scared for his life and the life of Ms. Breonna Taylor. And this is key right here. The police's incident report contained multiple errors. It listed Miss Taylor's injuries as none, even though she had been shot at least eight times and indicated that police had not forced their way into the apartment, though they used a battering ram to break open the door. Miss Taylor's family also said that it was outrageous that the police felt it necess necessary to, to conduct the raid in the middle of the night. And so what was the fallout? We know that one of the officers was terminated and the other officers were placed on administrative leave. The police chief, Robert Schrader, he wrote that um, in a pre-termination hearing letter that decided to proceed to terminate Hankinson, one of the officers involved in the shooting. And what did he say? He said in his pre-termination letter that Hankinson showed extreme indifference to the value of human life and his use of deadly force was improper because he failed to verify it was directed against someone who posed an immediate threat. This is the chief of police from Louisville, Kentucky. In his letter, his pre-termination letter against Brent Hankinson, the officer who fired 10 rounds. He went on to say that Hankinson, he accused Hankinson of blindly firing 10 rounds into Taylor's apartment and the one next door. 
The chief of police went on to say, I find your conduct a shock to the conscious. Chief Schrader repeated, I am alarmed and stunned you use deadly force in this fashion. Yet no arrests have been made in the killing of Breonna Taylor. And of course, I can go on and on. I have information about the killing of George Floyd, who was killed by strangulation, as you know, where the officers pinned him down and held him against his will, choking him and, and strangling him. There were issues with the police report, although it was on camera. And of course, the, the latest, one of the latest, the videos of a Wisconsin man being shot in the back several times, Jacob Blake, as he entered his car. So at this time, I can go on and give you details about a lot of the police killings in America. And I hear a lot of arguments from conservatives that always argue that these people, our people, deserve to die and that they were committing crimes or what have you. But if you look at the laws and if you research the Supreme Court cases on police killings, there are very limited cases where police should even use deadly force. So before I close out and take questions, this is the one of the most important parts of the, the class. Again, we've looked at police killings from my perspective and from many of our perspectives. These people, my brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters, they did not deserve to die. Regardless of what the opposition will say, these people did not deserve to die. And we have a culture of police killings that we have to change. We have to take a look at police policies that have been proven to work. Solutions. There are proven solutions. Police departments that use use of force policies kill significantly fewer people. But fewer departments have adopted them. Police departments that require officers to use all other means before shooting have 25% fewer police killings than the national average. And you would think that this policy would be adopted across the nation, but it hasn't. Two, police departments that require all use of force to be reported also have 25% fewer police killings. So the solution is to make officers report all use of force. Three, police departments that have banned chokeholds and strangleholds have 22% fewer police killings. Four, Police departments that have use of force continuums have 19% fewer police killings. A use of force continuum is a standard that provides law enforcement officers and civilians with guidelines as to how much force may be used against a resisting subject in a given situation. In some ways, it is similar to the U.S. military's de-escalation of force. Five, police departments that require de-escalation report 15% fewer police killings as opposed to police departments that do not require de-escalation. This next policy is key and breaks the silence of the blue code or blue shield. Police departments that place a duty to intervene on an officer if another officer uses excessive force report a 9% decrease in police killings. Seven, Police departments that restrict shooting at moving vehicles report 8% fewer, fewer police killings. And lastly, eight, police departments that require warnings before shooting report 5% fewer police killings than those, those departments with no requirement for warnings. Now we must ask ourselves if we have statistical data showing policies that reduce police killings, then why don't we implement them. Thank you. Now I'm open for questions. Open for questions. Uh, Ethan has a question. Um, yes, Ethan. So I was at my friend's house in June and he was watching Fox News and it showed that like the country was burning because of a lot of BLM protests and I went to one the next week and it was like very peaceful. So I did some research and it was like 90 something percent of them are peaceful and out of the ones that aren't like most of them are caused by people against BLM and I'm just kind of confused on how like such a large news news network can like 
say such a like I'm not saying other games are that were felt live, like that's a pretty big thing that they got wrong. I just don't understand how like they can convince millions of people that that's just not true. Thank you, Ethan. And yes, as you saw through everything I say, I always say do your independent research. I uh, talk with conservatives all the time. I talk to Republicans all the time. I'm an attorney. I just deliver the facts and the law. So that is very unfortunate that we do have news uh, outlets that are feeding on fears of people. I participated in a lot of the, the marches. We had a lot of them here in Atlanta. They were all peaceful. Now, there obviously has been violence in, in some of the, the protests, and a lot of us, a lot of people believe that those are coming from outside factions, but the majority of the protests have been peaceful. And if you follow my podcast and look at my, my sites, I'm out there with my camera. When I said that I spoke to people in the Satilla Shores neighborhood, I went down there with the NAACP. Everything was peaceful. But the fear mongering is dangerous, and so everyone must look at the information for yourselves. I don't care if you are a conservative Republican. Look at the information yourself. Read the information. We just want equality. Could you, uh, and speaking of peaceful protests, the one that was uh, in Washington, D.C. at the White House, that's been proven to be, it was very peaceful at the time. Uh, and, you know, they, they uh, some of the National Guardsmen are speaking up and saying they were ordered to go out there and use the kind of force they use, right? And so they're, and then Fox News even painted it as uh, it was it was not a peaceful protest and they had to protect the president. So again, play, you know, flaming of, uh, or just throwing more, more stuff onto the fire to get people all worked up. And now you have uh, one Fox News analyst saying that if Biden is elected, uh, anyone other than if Trump's not elected, then People like Black Lives Matter is going to go into these suburb suburban neighborhoods and destroy your homes, right? Yes. You know, so it's fear mongering. It's, it's fear mongering and it's dangerous. Me as a, a peaceful protester, why would I and my friends and family go to a protest to antagonize and fight the police and we're unarmed and outnumbered? So that right there doesn't even make sense. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Good question. Good research. Too. Any other questions? So what are some of the hurdles that uh, criminal defense lawyers uh, have to, um, barriers that they have to, to, to climb over to really get, to really defend their client to the best of their ability? Well, you know, I, I am a civil litigator, but I did teach criminal law. You know, when it, uh, when it comes to defending criminals, we know that uh, it's a constitutional right that even those who are accused of crimes have to have or they should have a proper legal representation. Unfortunately, for a lot of us who are poor or minority, don't have the money for a lot of quality legal representation. And so it's not there. And we have a lot of public defenders who are really good at what they do, but a lot of them are overworked. So I, I definitely believe that all citizens who are accused of a crime should have a decent representation. And that's why there are many funds out here to try to support a lot of the protesters who have been arrested and accused of looting and, and, and violence and graffiti and other things. But the problem, as you saw, is that the police officers are not being charged. I think one of the statistics was 99% of them during that time period between 2019 and 2013 were not charged with a crime. They weren't even charged with a crime. And when you do have them charged with a crime, the prosecutors are usually in this system this mm -hmm. that we discussed in Glenn County where they're all working together. That was just one example. That was just one example. We have thousands of counties, thousands of different independent agencies all living within this same culture of white privilege and black subjugation. I'm glad you uh, described um, Ahmad's killing as a it was a lynching, right? Because that's exactly what it was. It fits the um, definition, it, yes. It fits the definition, and it was domestic terrorism as well. Yes. Um, and, but now we have uh, uh, the top law official in the country bar, bar um, going after these protesters, 
saying that he's going to charge them with sedition. And sedition is the overthrow of the government, right? So shutting down our civil, our rights, our constitutional rights to peacefully protest. Right. Have our voices heard. Much like uh, a number of countries in South America where they have dictators. Uh, and if you try to protest, they'll throw you in jail. Yes. In China. So, you know, if we move into that kind of state, uh, I mean, it's going to be difficult to turn back. And I agree with Kwame, uh, because of your generation, Gen Z, and millennials. Yes. Uh, I have participated in a number of BLM uh, move, uh, marches, and overwhelmingly, 80% 80, 80 are young Caucasian people. Yes. Supporting and fighting. Yeah, I'm so proud. Yeah, when I go out and we're protesting for the the younger people, like I told you, it just really, really does something to my heart because we wouldn't be able to do it without them. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Any questions? Yeah, is it possible that the policies that um, like have led to like lower uh, levels of police murder are not actually making a difference, but just the departments that have those policies are less likely to have killings occur in them? Well, when you look at, I guess, statistical data, that's all that we have to go by. Is, or are these policies working in these situations, in these counties, in these departments? We have to try to implement them in other ones, because if we don't, we don't know. But I believe that the statistical data is backed by, uh, you know, professionals who research the variables who believe that it would. Yeah, and uh, good point. I was a uh, military, military police officer for uh, six years. Uh, in the military, implementing a de-escalation as opposed to shoot first and ask questions later, uh, that started in the late 80s, right? And understanding that uh, not every individual you confront that you consider to be an enemy is someone that you need to kill. So using de-escalation tactics, and that has been working in the military quite a bit. So um, so you mentioned that um, as, as what a policy, possible strategy that uh, could assist in uh, better training these police officers and also Let's talk a little bit about the defund the police, which I don't like that term. I think they should use a different term, but that's what they have, which it really should be about reinventing the police. The reinventing how we police America. Reinventing the fact that, um, you know, we don't want our police to go out and deal with people who have mental health issues, because they're not trained to do that, right? That's why people go to school for four, eight years to become psychologists and counselors and, and 12 years to be psychiatrists, right? They should be able to deal with those who are mentally uh, challenged, right? Instead of sending our police officers out there to deal with them, right? And then in the court system, try and prove that this mental, this mental illness was the cause of this individual engaging in some crime. The bar is very high for that, isn't it, you know, Yes. Because, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very, very high. So you have people out there who are mentally challenged, mentally ill, they need help, and the legal system is not, does not have designed to have the laws to protect them. So they're arrested, charged with a the crime, there really is about mental illness and mental issues, but the courts have a high bar in your, your uh, standard in terms of to prove, the defense attorney to prove my client is innocent, innocent because of this mental illness. Good question. Any other questions? Do you want to ask uh, Kwame his 20 plus years of civil litigation experience? Do you want to ask him what it's like to be in the court? I mentioned to them, Kwame, that um, litigators are fierce fighters. However, getting into court these days is not uh, as, as, as it was 50 years ago. Most cases settle. Yes. Yeah, about 90% of our civil litigation cases will be resolved before trial, either dismissed or settled. And in settlement, you have ADR, alternative dispute resolution, which could be mediation or arbitration. But those uh, smaller number, 10% uh, will make it to trial, but most cases don't. And then everything has really changed over the last 50 years, as you said, um, before, 
60 years ago, there weren't paralegals. There were legal assistants and legal secretaries. Well, now paralegals are to attorneys like what nurses are to doctors. So the field is expanding. We know populations have expanded. The courts have not caught up with that expansion. So we have uh, courts that are being crowded with a lot of cases, criminal and civil. And in our civil trials, we do not allow what they call trial by ambush. If people have seen some of the old Perry Mason TV shows, they always had surprise witnesses who came in and really turned around the cases. Those were ambushes. The law doesn't allow for that now. So a lot of cases in litigation are resolved during or after the discovery period. Because when we go to trial, we pretty much both sides have to know by law what evidence the other side has. And that, again, is to further uh, uh, ADR, alternative dispute resolution, because litigation is costly and the courts want us to resolve disputes between ourselves. And that's the difference between civil litigation and criminal litigation. The criminal law, we look at crimes against people. They are prosecuted by the state, the state or the federal government, which we consider the state. In civil litigation, you have civil wrongs where two private parties have disputes over damages. And the private party can be a government or the, U the U.S. or a corporation or individual. But in the civil litigation, you have disputes between private parties. And in the criminal law, you have crimes against the state that are prosecuted by the state. Questions? I think I have one other one. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. Um, you see how Kwame uh, went through the facts of those cases, right? And then he focused on the, what the law, right? Qualified immunity. Um, you know, what was the other standard he used in terms of yeah, the standard that he used in determining whether the uh, individual had a right to the Georgia statute? You know, you brought up the Georgia statute about. A citizen could make arrest, a private arrest. So attorneys have to do all of that kind of work. Read every newspaper article, read every secondary source, read every uh, police report, uh, every other uh, witness statement. So you do a huge bulk of the work before you get to the point where you're making a decision. This is what we're going to go to trial on. Right? So you're doing a, a lot of research and reading, and you, when a client comes to you and says, I, you know, I want you to take my case, and you accept that case, you accept that you're going to do the kind of work that Kwame just gave you in terms of looking at all of the issues, all the information, all the statements, asking for doing discovery, making sure you get all of the information. Um, so just wanted to point that out, that uh, how much work and effort goes into before you step into a courtroom and say, Your Honor, I'm ready to charge this case, which is a whole nother ball of wax, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, thank you, Carl. This is Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. And Professor Love, I'll see you around. Thank you. All right, I will check with you soon. Bye.